Hello and welcome to Into the Woods with Holly Wharton. This podcast is all about our journey into the woods of ourselves, getting to know who we are, where we are, and where we're going in life so that we can create the life that we want to live. It's about deepening your connection with yourself, taking inspired action, and really trusting yourself and your intuition. It's also about mindset. Our beliefs are such an important part of this journey, and there are so many ways for us to change our mindset so that we can more easily live a life of expansive joy. This podcast is also about going literally into the woods and spending time in nature, and how that can help us on our own personal journey of self-knowledge. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now let's get into this week's episode. Hello, adventurers, and welcome to the Into the Woods podcast, episode 433. This is your host, Holly Wharton, and I'm back with another exciting guest. Today, I'm talking with Robert Twigger. Now, I've known Rob for several years now, and I'm a huge fan of his books. He's gone on some big, wild adventures in his life, and he's written books about most of them. So in this episode, we discuss how adventure satisfies our need to do childish or childlike things. We also talk about how adventure can be an antidote to anxiety. I think you'll find this episode both fascinating and inspiring, and I hope it gets you thinking about your next adventures. So who is Robert Twigger? He's an award-winning writer who has published 12 books, mainly about adventurous travel. His website is robertwigger.com, and he produces a quarterly comic about memoir and adventure called This Simple Life, and I'll link to that in the show notes. So what are you going to learn on this week's episode. We talk about how adventure satisfies our need to do childish things, how adventure can be an antidote to anxiety, Rob's recent adventure visiting all 36 islands in the Lake District, the core skills and mindsets that can help us to get the most out of our adventures, and how people can start to have their own micro-adventures. We talk about climbing, we talk about hiking, we talk about canoeing across Canada, we talk about big snake hunting, We talk about how to get started with inflatable canoes, and we talk about Rob's most recent book, which was Walking the Great North Line from Stonehenge to Lindisfarne, and many more things. So I hope you find this episode interesting and useful, as always, and enjoy. Hey, Rob, how are you doing today? Pretty good. Good. I'm really looking forward to talking to you about adventure. Uh, Me too. In fact, today, as I was doing my daily adventurous bike ride (laughs) oh yeah I actually this is something I do know something about at least a little bit (laughs) so tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do okay I'm non-fiction author I've been a professional writer since 1995 and I really started by doing martial arts and writing about martial arts and then I kind of graduated to doing all kinds of strange adventures including hunting for giant snakes and paddling across Canada in a birch bark canoe and looking for lost oases in the desert so I I kind of really took the adventure idea and used it to write books so I wasn't really sure was I really adventuring and writing books to earn money to adventures or was I really writing books it's it's sort of sometimes it's the books have been in the forefront and sometimes the adventures have Mm. So what does adventure mean to you? To me, yeah. I always think the best definition of adventure is one given by the climber, Reinhold Messner. And he said, it's when you leave home and you don't know where you're going to sleep that night. Oh, I like that. And it's kind of cool because if you think about things like hitchhiking, which is sort of tame in a way, I mean, just standing by the road, that's a real adventure because you yeah. don't know where you end up and you speak to lots of different people. So it's kind of important because I always think thrills, like go bungee jumping, go to a section of the river, just run the rapids. People call it an adventure, but I don't know whether that is because mm-hmm. you kind of know where you're going. Yeah, yeah, you do. You don't know what the actual experience is going to be like. Yeah. <laughs> so there's an element of the unknown, but you definitely probably know where you're going to be sleeping that night. Yeah, you do. And I guess the first time you run those rapids or the first time you do the bungee jump, yeah, mm. that counts as an adventure. But When you've done it several times, I think repeating the same thing means it's not really an adventure. Mm, Even though it's kind of different every time? Well, then you're not repeating it. I mean, Ah, I don't know. True, yeah. (laughs) Well, I mean, in general, in general terms. Yeah. 
and I don't want to sort of outlaw what people are doing, but I know for myself, yeah, it's really good the first time you do something mm. and just not sure whether it'll work or not, and you kind of, you know, have a lot of faith and luck and all of those things, which sort of fade into the background a bit once you kind of really know what you're doing. Mm, yeah, it's a very different experience. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that you use things like bungee jumping as an example, because I did that back in 1996 and, and really enjoyed it. And I was glad that I did it, but I never really felt the need to do it again. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a bit like skydiving. I mean, some people just get hooked to it, but yeah. I think it's a thrill. Mm. And that's slightly different from an adventure, because I think an adventure is a learning experience as mm, well. Absolutely. So... How does adventure satisfy our need to do childish things? Well, I mean, it's good you brought that up. I mean, I was thinking about that, like mountain biking. Today I passed someone on a horse and I thought, well, I guess a, a mountain bike is more childish than a horse. <laughs> and they're both more childish than a car. I saw car parts. And I thought, <laughs> but I like that side to it because I think these machines kind of dominate our lives. And, and what we consider to be adult is actually just some kind of established dominance that may not be true or useful or mm. or anything and actually maybe crushing our spirit i think the thing about childish stuff childish type adventures using childish kit i've got a pack raft it looks like a little bait a little toy but it really pleases me to do that i feel that in some way i'm i don't know just being free in the way that kids yeah. are free i think that's something to do with maybe all societies become a bit oppressive yeah, absolutely. Especially like in the last year and a half with lockdown and all these rules and yeah. regulations and you must wear a mask, you must do this, you must not do this. Yeah. I think we've got even more rules than we've ever had before. It sometimes feels that way. Yeah. I didn't really mind the, the mask wearing and or any of it at all because I'm slightly introverted anyway. So <laughs> I kind of didn't mind it, but I realized it actually had a very pernicious effect on people's, um, it created fear. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And it, and it created a kind of virus of fear. I know a lot of people have had mental health issues mm. exacerbated during lockdown. And I think anxiety, especially anxiety is fear, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, if you sit indoors too long, you get scared of going outside. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah. So I for me, adventure is, a, is the antithesis of that. One of the great things about adventure, and I forced myself to do it actually a few weeks ago, get out in the rain, go up to the Lake District. For, I didn't want to do it at all, but I knew I needed to do it. And of course, after a few days, I just felt fantastic. Yeah, so you've said that adventure is kind of an antidote to anxiety. And, and I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I've never really struggled with anxiety until this last lockdown that we had in the winter. And I got to a point where it was just like, I was felt like I was barely hanging on. It was like, I need to do something. And then once things started opening up and I was able to get out and go camping and spend more time doing different things in the outdoors and get further away from home rather than just going back and forth on all of my close by trails, mm. it really just made a big difference. Mm. Yeah. A massive difference. So yeah. how do you think adventure affects us, whether that's like neurophysiologically or metabolically or in other ways that can help reduce anxiety? What is it about adventure that helps us with mental health and anxiety? Well, I think when you get aroused, you know, I don't like the word aroused. It sounds a bit weird. When you get surprised or shocked, the fight or flight mm. mechanism kicks in. You get enhanced adrenaline and so on. And you can recalibrate. You can you can register that as something unpleasant, mm -hmm. depending on the context. You can register that as something exciting and interesting by giving it a different context. Yeah. And I think adventure is I always remember this case when I arrived, I went to this canoe trip, I arrived in Canada and no one was at the airport to meet me. There'd been a cock up. And so I'm in Ottawa, it's like evening. I don't know what to do. And I started talking to this guy outside who's just like a construction worker. And he said, hey, but it's uh, it's all part of the adventure, right? <laughs> Suddenly, just for a switch in my head, of course yeah. it is. And he told me that you could crash in the multi-faith Chapel, little known fact, if you're ever stuck in an airport, crash in the multi faith <laughs> chapel. <laughs> no one will ever throw you out. <laughs> so I did, and it was just cool. And in fact, a guy also crashed there, and I had a bit of a chat with him, and that was part of the adventure. So it's like recalibrate. Sometimes when I'm driving, and it's really raining, and it's dark, it's horrible. And so I switch, a, and it's kind of nerve-wracking in a funny way, and I switch, switch my head, and I go, Oh, now this is an adventure. And I look for things like the tail lights to guide me. And so everything, even the little things become important. And it just changes the whole experience rather than being like nightmarish or dangerous or whatever. Yeah. And it's absolutely the same event, but 
viewed yeah. through a different lens. Yeah, it's just putting different goggles on. Yes. And so, of course, it connects to different parts of the brain. So, you know, once you allow anxiety to get a hold, it starts connecting to different parts of the brain. I mean, the brain is a plastic organ, we know. Mm. So all these new connections start being made. And so over time, it grows. So the, so the anxiety does become real. It occupies real estate in your brain. So what you need to do is you need to start rewiring the brain. And so to associate adventure with lots of good things and or the fight or flight or heightened sense of danger with lots of positive sensations. And this is why I was saying it's a learning experience, because you're doing something new for the first time. You're laying down new connections. So you are stimulating your brain. And well, this is probably moves into something else, but this is why it's a good thing for mm. your brain. It's a learning experience. Yeah, absolutely. It gets you outside of your comfort zone in a mostly probably safe environment without being kind of like in the danger zone. <laughs> and that really control does change your you brain. You control it, don't you? You yeah. control how much danger. I mean, it's really just whatever you choose. I mean, today I'll do this cycle ride and it involves riding along this muddy track on the side of a ditch. Now, the bike tires haven't got great grip. The front tires, not proper mountain bike tires. So I started to slide into the ditch. And I thought, wow, if I fall in that ditch, it's going to be really unpleasant. I might even hurt myself. So I had to scale it back a bit. So even on a tiny little journey, you mm. can calibrate it. But what I love is an adventure is somewhere where you, you take control of what level of danger you want. It's not crazy. This is yeah. what I think outside people who haven't done adventuring think, oh, they're just crazy. They're doing mountain climbing. They're doing whitewater rafting. But, but all the people who do these things are very much in control of the mm. level of danger that they want. Yeah, I was just talking the other day to a friend about, we were messaging about, have you seen that documentary Free Solo? I have, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so we were talking about that because she's a climber and I'm not a climber. So I... I loved that documentary, but it was just like, I can't believe that someone would put themselves in that kind of danger. But he did it and he survived. Clearly, he knew what he was doing and he had clearly trained for it and prepared for it. So I think someone who's trained for something and prepared for it is in a very different place from compared to me that doesn't yeah. know anything about climbing. Well, what I mean, it's quite interesting. There's also you may have seen these videos by this guy, Danny McCaskill, who's an incredible mountain biker. And he does one where he mountain bikes from the top of Edinburgh Castle. I mean, huge jumps. And another one where he goes the, the Coolin Ridge. Now, the Coolin Ridge is actually a climbing route. It's a oh. V-D climbing route. He does it on a mountain bike. Oh, wow. It's incredible. But Danny McCaskill always, before he does stuff, he visualizes it and sees what his feeling is about it. And he said the few times where he's ignored the feeling, he's had bad accidents, like he broke mm. his back in one, one accident. And... It's very similar with climbers. You've got to develop a feeling, which is an intuition. I mean, this is why it's so interesting, because you're really out at the edge where you're having to project and know what you're going to be, how it's going to go. It becomes a very interesting sort of almost telepathic exercise. So the people doing, usually when climbers have serious accidents, it's usually in high mountains where it's a total random, it's an avalanche, it's high winds. But even there, sometimes... It can be intuition. I remember reading about, I mean, some of the guys who survived for years and years, like Chris Bonington. I remember reading a account about him on some high peak in the Himalayas. And at one point he says, oh, I think I'm going to go back to the camp now. He just turns back. All the others think, oh, he's an oldster. They push on and they all have a terrible accident. Oh, wow. Break legs and one of them dies. It's sort of, he had that intuition. So there's some, that's another thing that intrigues me, people who have learned to develop that as well. Mm. Well, I think once you've been on various adventures and outdoors things, it's like your brain picks up on little clues that maybe your conscious mind doesn't, but some yeah. part of your brain does. And it's like, mm, danger, maybe head back yeah. home. Yeah. Well, you know that luck always run, goes in runs. So you know that on a day when various sort of small bad things happen, you know you've got to be careful. You mm. just know that. The second thing I'm always looking out for is accidents are always cumulative, almost always cumulative. So it's like one thing leads to another thing. Yeah. So you, you kind of lose something. The canoe gets a hole in it, something. And these are all cumulative. And so you have to put a stop to it. You know, yeah. you can't just hope that things will get better. And recognizing those chains at the beginning, I think, is a, a key part of being on an adventure. And also, I'm extremely conservative when I'm out in the wilderness. I mean, I, I'm really way more conservative than probably most regular person would be. That's, make, that's what I'm like. Yeah. So can you give a couple of examples of some adventures that maybe helped you with your own anxiety and mental health? 
as I said, I went to the Lake District. I'm doing this book about visiting islands in the Lake District. It's pretty Ooh. easy. I mean, there are islands in a lake. <laughs> but it's getting a bit colder now, so I didn't want to fall in the water. And some of them, the waves can get quite big, you know, because it's windy and wet. Mm. And uh, got a tiny little pack craft. So kind of had to bite the bullet and do it. And the last thing I did was to go to this small island. It's no more than, I don't know, 200 meters from the shore. Very close. But I had to launch it, the pack raft, into a small river that was quite in spate because it was just pouring with rain. I realized it's been pouring with rain mm. recently. So I'm completely saturated. I've been waiting an hour for the rain to stop. Hadn't stopped. Got in the boat, immediately pulled away by the river. But... Even in the last small time I'd been in the lake, just I'd realized that when a river looks really fast, when you put a boat in it, the boat never moves really that fast. So rivers always look faster than they are. Mm. So I kind of had that more of a measure of sense of control. And, and that had just come over the brief period that I'd been visiting the lake district and doing that. And that just feeling of more control. And anyway, I did this trip, got signed, no problem, got back, no problem. And every little piece of just doing that every time you prove to yourself you can you know you, you're in a situation where you think oh that's dangerous and then you do it each time you reduce your general levels of anxiety and I know that I was less anxious because when I start driving I would drive much faster <laughs> <laughs> I drive much much faster and much more casually this is probably a terrible you know you know my god this is now I'll end <laughs> but, you know, hopefully touch wood it won't but it's just much more confident mm. you know much more relaxed Mm. I always feel like that after a trip. If I've been in the wilderness for a long time, I always feel so much more relaxed. And things like driving, which would normally, if you're on a crowded motorway, it can get kind of stressful. There's no stress level. So it's the removal of, of the things that try give rise to anxiety, stress, you know, mm. overthinking, internal thinking, looking inwards. All of those things are countered by an adventure. You look outwards, you slow down, and whatever you do seems to return control to you so you feel like you're in control of your destiny yeah i feel often like it's like life gets simplified because yeah. you're just doing this one thing you know you're just doing the hiking or the running yeah. or the rafting or whatever but you've got this one thing that you have to do rather yeah. than multitasking with all the other things that we do in life yeah i think that's a really good point i think it's about that i love that simplification mm. what do you have to do you have to do your miles mm -hmm. you have to do your trip whatever it is you make your food you go to sleep you don't feel the need to have, you know, a drink or, a, you know, a telly program. I mean, I used to like to read a book or something, but even if you don't have that, it's yeah. enough. You've done your one thing. Yeah. I think that's an important aspect, the simplification. And, and I like using all the gear, you know, like sleeping bags and the yes. same clothes and all that stuff. I, it just makes it, I don't know, it's easier, simpler. Yeah. 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 So tell us a little bit more about visiting all 36 islands in the Lake District. Yeah, so this is a new book I'm doing, and well, I'm writing it now, so it'll be out probably next year. And actually, mm. it will be out th this time next year. And the idea came from I thought if the shit really hit the fan, you know, if there was a sort of like meltdown of society, this is way before, this is like 20 years ago, where would I hide out? Mm. And I thought, okay, on an island in a lake, but the lake probably ought to be like a reservoir or something that may be controlled by a utilities company with fencing. So you're not allowed to go on the lake. So you'd sneak in there. <laughs> anyway, so this idea had been kicking around for years and years. And then I also, as a kid, was very into the books of Arthur Ransom. And these are children's books set in the Lake District and the kids camp on an island. So these two twin sources of inspiration, finally, I thought, oh, actually, maybe I should check out what these islands are like, how many there are. So I did, and there are about 30, official ones are about 36. There are a few more, but there are 36 sort of decent-sized islands in the Lake District. Some are on, I mean, all the lakes in the Lake District were originally lakes. Some have grown and become mm. reservoirs. You know, they put dams in and raised the level and thus created islands where there weren't them. Uh, yeah. The rest are all natural islands. So I set out to visit all of them and just see how different they were. And it's really interesting because every time you visit an island, however small, one of them was so small I could wade to it. <laughs> there, there's always a sense of excitement because you know it'll be different. Every single island is different. They have different ecosystems. They have different birds and mushrooms and trees. And sometimes you come across weird stuff. Like on one island, I came across this overgrown grave. And mm. it was a proper gravestone to a dog called Crusoe, <laughs> a Newfoundland dog that had died in 1870. And its owner, who was like a local well-off member of the gentry, had paid to have him interred on an island. 
kind of weird, really strange. Mm-hmm. So I found lots of weird stuff like that. So that also added to it. And are these islands that are easy to visit, or do you really have to work well, out and to get there? The lake. It depends on the lake. So some of the lakes are real tourist mm. hotspots, Windermere, Ullswater. You know, they have tourist yeah. steamers gotten down them, paddleboarders. And you could paddleboard to any of the islands on those lakes. You could swim to quite a few of them. I mean, if you're a really good swimmer, you could probably swim to all of them. But in fact, I woke up one morning on one island and there was a guy swimming. And he was one of those swimmers who expend vast amounts of energy, kind of chopping at the water. (laughs) I thought, my God, I mean, that guy, if he really knew how to swim, he'd be able to go forever because he swam all around the island. He just (laughs) did a complete circuit of the island. You could visit them in, in any way you like. But the mm. advantage of using a canoe, which is what I used, or a pack raft, which I also used, is you can take all your kit with you so you camp on the island. Having said that, you are not supposed to camp on most of the islands. You're not supposed to camp on them, mm. but people do. Mm-hmm. Like most wild camping in this country. Yeah, <laughs> and, you know, and to be honest, there's only one island I came across like a big mess with loads of bottles and crap in a fireplace. Almost all of them no mess at all nothing Mm. so there were fireplaces but nobody had actually damaged them Oldswater is probably one of the most popular islands and the lakes and one of the islands there is really quite small and almost every stick had gone everything yeah so you wrote a book called micromastery now do you think that there are core skill sets or mindsets that can help us to get the most out of our adventures ah it certainly helps to be comfortable with being in the wilderness and that means lighting fires not kicking over the cooking pot and putting the fire out (laughs) putting up your tent i mean i had a really good friend i mean he's not like this now but when he started he told me he had a phobia of tents because he had experience in the boy scouts i thought my god (laughs) what does that mean but yeah he didn't like the pressure which you can sort of get you know everyone's putting the tent up you don't know how to do yours and it keeps falling down so learn how to put your tent up learn how to start a fire, learn how to get water, you know, so it's not going to kill you. Uh, <laughs> just those sort of outdoor skills. Yeah. And so you're confident about sleeping out. Because I think that for me, adventures involve, yeah, sleeping out. I mean, there are some adventures I can conceive of. Like I've got one idea to go down this certain river from its, it's not a very long river, but from the source mm-hmm. right to the sea. And I can do that in one day. Mm-hmm. So that doesn't involve camping out. Mm-hmm. But It does involve a a sort of an appreciation of nature, I think, and and how nature works. So all of those things are probably quite useful. Mm, Yeah. What about mindsets? Is there a particular mindset that people have or could have or should have that could help them to get the most out of their adventures? Yeah, don't look for rules. Mm. So I think there are people who, oh, you know, you've got to have a life jacket. You've got to have this. You've got to do that. I belong to this canoe thing on a Facebook group about canoe. Someone goes, oh, they're holding their paddle wrong. Oh, <laughs> God. I mean, give him a break. It's only a photo. I mean, <laughs> people are always trying to set rules for things. I think the whole idea of adventure is it's just totally up to you. You choose your level of comfort, hmm. your level of safety, your level of everything, and it's entirely up to you. If you want to paddleboard stark naked down the Thames with no kit, that's entirely up to you. And I don't think I, anyone should tell you what to do so i think it's like there are no rules you've got Mm. to use your own nous to decide what level you want to engage in what level of adventure you know whether you're going to do it in woolen clothes or whether you're going to wear a dry suit whether you're going to go swimming with just your underpants on or whether you're going to wear a wetsuit as well all that kind of stuff so i the mindset i think you've got to get rid of the rule-based mindset and Mm. go experiment you've got to sort of put an experimenter's head on and test an experiment and say, I mean, I'm just thinking aloud here, but a lot of people have got their management head on, you know, yes. managing the situation. And it's much better to have the experiment ahead, you know, let's see what happens and do it safely. You know, like yeah. for me, when I went there, I didn't have a dry suit. I thought if I fall in there and I'm like half a mile out in, in the lake, I'm probably going to get cold and maybe not even be able to swim back. So I got these chest weight, I've got these neoprene chest waders and I put a belt and people do use them as kind of substitute dry suits, put a belt around it and a mm-hmm. bungee cord so no water can get into them. Mm-hmm. Then I felt confident because I knew, okay, if I fall in, I won't get cold because, and also these will keep me on the surface because they're full of air. So it's sort of, that sort of mindset is a, a kind of innovative and experimental head is the one you want, I think. Absolutely. And I think that that goes along with being open and curious about 
your adventure or about your activity that you've chosen yeah. rather than having like expectations. Like I must yeah. be like this and it must yeah. be like that. And I want it to be this way. Like yeah. that's kind of planning too much and, and yeah. setting up your own rules for the activity. Yeah, I think you're so right. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people will read an account of something and then think that they should just replicate it. But that's not what it's about. I think the best adventures are just when you have the bare bones of something mm. and then you go out and experience it. So mm. you kind of know about some place, but you don't really know all the details. Well, I think that brings us back to what we were talking about earlier about being childish with our adventures or adventures satisfying our need or our desire to do childish things because when you're playing as a kid you you know you're playing house or you're playing yeah. pirate or whatever but it's like there are no rules to it you're just kind yeah. of doing this thing and it's fun and that's enough yeah. when i was a kid i used to cross the fields and i used to pretend to be an explorer so i had my notebook and i would mm. write down the things i'd seen and i had a compass so i'd like follow the compass so i was already kind of imitating what I thought was an adult activity. Now I know <laughs> that it's always going to be a childish activity. <laughs> but when I do these things, I try to do them. I've got slightly more professional about doing these things, which sort of felt at first a little bit childish when I was doing them. So taking notes of things, photographing things, having my routines, doing all that stuff. And I kind of think of it now in a curious way as a professionalization of my childish thing. But it still it seems childish because ordinary mm. people are out there and they, they're kind of doing their regular stuff on a power boat or something. Yeah. But to me, I mean, it is just a way of looking at things. I just think of them as being in the adult world, even mm -hmm. though actually what they're doing is just pratting around. And I'm actually doing something maybe slightly serious, sort of noting down all the different types of tree on this mm. island. But it still feels that I'm engaged in some childish activity, which is fine. I'm very, very happy with that. One of the good things about adventure is to feel happy with being weak, happy mm. with being in a minority, you know, not needing to be part of a gang or a mm. big enterprise, because all of those things have brought nothing but misery to the world, usually. Mm. <laughs> well, I think the word childish can have such negative connotations yeah, sometimes, yeah, yeah. when really, it's like having that lens of play. It's yeah. childish play. It can yeah. be a positive thing, rather than saying, oh, you know, that's too childish. That's not good enough. Yeah. That's adults yeah. don't do that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, totally. You Being able to play, that's really necessary. Mm. So why do you think it is necessary to play or to be childish in life? Because as people get older, they usually become grimmer and sadder. <laughs> and that just seems like a terrible way to go. <laughs> and I've observed indigenous peoples who I've traveled with in their 60s and 70s, and they're often really childlike. They often have mm. a really good sense of humor and they prat around like they'll suddenly run down a sand dune, been with Bedouins like that and fart around. Or they'll, I've been with indigenous peoples in the jungle and they'll just, you know, suddenly do something really crazy, like real comedians mm. and they're like 70 or something. And they don't have any, they'll suddenly start dancing or something. They don't have any sort of inhibitions mm. about that kind of thing because their culture is much more mature than ours in many ways. And they've realized the necessity to maintain that open playful approach because when you're being playful you're open to learning yes. you're open to new things and yeah i think that people in the west tend to be rigid and even when they start doing adventures like man's bag i see people around where i live they have like face masks all the right gear and they ride in this really serious way so they're like forcing right other walkers off the path and mm. they are not considerate mm -hmm. and just taking it way too seriously so what they've done is they've taken something that's actually a real fun activity and turned it into another kind of work mm -hmm. so i think of those indigenous people as being superior in, mm -hmm. in this respect anyway yeah well it's like they know when to work and they know when to play yeah. and, and they allow themselves they give themselves permission to play exactly yeah and they give, exactly, they give themselves permission and they have a real laugh. They, they really enjoy themselves. And I think it would be terrible. As you're getting older, you have to learn some things and you should be able to learn how to have an even better time. Mm. Because most people seem to actually have a worse time as they go. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to be more serious. <laughs> yeah. I'm told that all the time, but it's just a control thing. When yeah. people are telling you to be more serious, they're just trying to control it. Yeah. More rules, more gatekeeping. Uh, so what are your top three favorite adventures that you've done if you had to pick them? Well, it took three years. Each year I went for about three months and I crossed quite a large part of Canada from Lake Athabasca up the Peace River over the Rocky Mountains and down to the Pacific in a birch bark canoe. And that, I often think about that journey. It had loads of different things in it, different elements. The final part was a 350 kilometer walk across the inland plateau of British Columbia. So it was a, it had loads of 
variety. So that is probably my favorite mm. adventure that I did. I did quite a lot of stuff in the desert, and I have a very great fondness for traveling in the desert. Some of that was done in vehicles, which is really good fun. I mean, vehicles, I'm generally opposed to vehicle born adventures, but in the desert, somehow a vehicle is quite. <laughs> it's allowed. <laughs> There are no roads, so it's good. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite funny, actually, to take someone into the desert in a vehicle and they go, I've never been off a road before in my life. Mm. And, oh, okay. Yeah. And, of course, there you can drive for hundreds and hundreds yeah. of kilometers. And uh, not even see a road. Not even see a road. So that was good. And those are the top two mm. that I remember. I mean, I did the hunting for the big snake was really interesting, but it was quite grueling. It was all in the jungle. Mm. And... Yeah, I kind of like the jungle, but I'm not a great, I don't think I'm a big forest person. You spend two or three weeks and you don't see the sun. I get a bit gloomy. Um, <laughs> I'm a river man. I think mm. what I really like are rivers. Mm -hmm. That's my number one thing. I like mountains and deserts, but I'm, I don't think I'm totally wedded to jungles and forests. Hmm, interesting. So what would you say is your most adventurous adventure? Was that Canada or is something else? I mean, the thing about Canada is it was pretty well planned. There were certain things, elements in it that were dangerous, but I was always with a group of people. Mm. It was pretty adventurous in the sense that no one had done this route, the exact route that we mm -hmm. were doing since 1793. Of course, oh. elements had all been done, but no one had strung it all together since the first time it had been done. So in that sense, it was an adventure. But of course, I've contradicted my thing about doing being the first person to do it. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I just think of it as a process. Yeah. I'm not really too much thinking about looking back. I'm mm. thinking about new ones mm. that I want to keep doing, you know, and what I would do. Sometimes I think, oh, shit, if my knees go, what will I do? I know mm. I'll do kayaking because then I don't need to walk, you know, and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the good thing is to have variety of interests in terms of adventures. As you said, if you get injured with one thing, then you can do something else. Yeah. I mean... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm thinking about the canoe trip where at the beginning we couldn't go against the current, so we had to tow the boat. Ooh. So you're walking and towing a boat, but some of the time you could get a rest in the canoe. Actually, it was fantastic because <laughs> you never had to walk for hours and hours, so you never developed any kind of repetitive strain type mm. in injuries, which you do if you're walking for eight hours a day or cycling for eight hours a day or even paddling for eight hours a day. Mm. I kind of like the cross-training effect of certain types of travel. So, mm -hmm. for example, this using this pack raft, you hike, and then when you get to a river or a lake, you blow up your pack raft, and then you do a bit of paddling. Mm -hmm. And somehow that kind of variety I really like. I'm not sure I want to go back to mono-adventuring. I like the idea of combining lots of different types of transport. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, say going into the future... Talking about future adventures, can you talk about any adventures that you have planned for the future, whether they involve books or... Most of my adventures, to justify them, now this is where it ceases <laughs> to be uh, childish, I have to write a book about them, that's what I tell myself, or I have to do, I've just started this quarterly comic. Yes. There are a couple of stories in each one of them will always be some kind of an adventure. Mm -hmm. And comics are a pretty good way of depicting adventures. You could spend a lot of time words describing something, but a picture can describe it much better. Yeah. But anyway, books justify it for me. So that's the point of that. And what book do I have in plan? Well, one I have planned is to go to take, build a log boat and launch it at Bella Coola and then travel up the coast to Alaska. Do you know the, what they call the inside passage that protected by lots of islands on mm -hmm. the west from Vancouver northwards? So you're not facing the full might of oh. the Pacific Ocean. And it's a journey that's done by quite a few people. But there's lots of different ways to do that journey. And I would like to do it in a log boat that I have built. Nice. That's something I've got, possibly not next year, but maybe the year after. Hmm. We'll see. And what adventure would you most like to have? I've always been keen on the idea of sailing in the South Seas, going hmm. to lots of different islands in the South Seas. But I'm actually a terrible sailor and probably it'd be quite dangerous to do it. I've sort of got them. Um, I've had a number of sort of near misses with sailing. So I just think, as I have with rock climbing. Mm. And I think sometimes you just got to take the evidence, you know, <laughs> this is not what I should be doing. <laughs> if I could have to go on someone else's boat, I think I'd really like that, mm. going to travel around the South Sea Islands, yeah. That sounds lovely, especially with the weather we've been having lately. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. 
So how can a person start to have micro adventures in their own day to day to day life? Like if they're a person who's been living kind of a sedentary rules based life and they want to kind of break out and try something new, how can they start to have their own micro adventures? Well, I think I actually met a guy like this. I did this walk up England a couple of years ago and I met a guy and he was sort of going a bit mad. He was an architect. But of course, when you're an architect, you just need a computer. He was mainly based at home. So he's living at home. And he said he was going crazy. And then he bought a tent. He just went to a campsite in the Lake District or he was in Derbyshire. And then he just slept in the tent and he just went out for walks. And he thought that was great. And then he got a bicycle. He said the big revelation for him is when he bought a bike with panniers and he could put the tent in the bike and then just ride out of his front door. And this is this thing, not knowing where he's going to camp. Okay, he maybe knew where the campsites were. I mean, he hadn't started wild camping, but that was the next thing he was going to do. So there are plenty of just very nice, just ordinary campsites, not fancy or expensive, that you can just put your tent up in. And that's like the start to doing something and getting out and do your own steam. I think that's the thing. Either get a bike, go hiking, or get a canoe or a boat or something. Mm, yes, yes, yes. That gets you off the uh, beaten track. Yeah, I think the rivers, they're not really wilderness, but they're about as close to wilderness as you can get yeah. in England because they're a kind of no man's land. If you belong to the British Canoe Union, you have the right to paddle on vast numbers of rivers. and You can more or less get away with most of them. It's not really like walking across a farmer's fields. Going through those same fields in a river seems much more adventurous. And you can camp on islands. There are always small islands and rivers and things. So I really recommend people to get out onto rivers because it does change your experience. It does seem more adventurous than simply walking. Hmm. And what's the learning curve like for that? Like, do you need to take a canoeing course or what do you need to know to get started? I would say get yourself an inflatable canoe. Mm -hmm. Now, there are two types. There are these high pressure ones, which are more like paddle boards, and they look really like canoes. Hmm. And there are these others, which kind of look a little bit more like rafts because they're low pressure i would go for one of those they're almost impossible to tip up you can buy one that weighs about 12 kilos so you can carry it one of those little luggage trolleys you know like people use for carrying Mm. suitcases Mm -hmm. you could transport it on that or even in a backpack if you've got more money you could buy a pack raft but they're expensive inflatable canoes are not expensive you can transport them anywhere you're never going to fall in and even if you do fall in it's a life raft, you know, it can <laughs> ever sink. So you can just get straight back into it. In mm-hmm. fact, one of my favorite adventurers is a woman called Audrey Sutherland. She's now in her 80s. Maybe she's even 90. And she started by swim adventuring around Hawaii, where she would swim from coast from cove to cove. And she started by towing her, her gear in a Tahiti, a Sevalo Tahiti, which is the cheapest form of inflatable canoe you can get. Then she started paddling it. And then she moved to Alaska and she started going up the coast of Alaska. And she said what she did was she loaded her canoe and capsized it 10 times in the surf and got back into it to prove to herself that she was safe for traveling alone. Inflatable canoe is one of the safest forms of solo canoe travel because of that factor. You're always safer going with somebody else. But if you are going to go alone, an inflatable is a really good way to go. They are slower, but what the hell? You're not in a rush. If you're in a rush, you're in the wrong game. Mm, Absolutely. So if you could recommend just one of your books for listeners, which one would it be? What's a good starting point to your work? Well, my favorite right now is Voyageur, which is the one about the canoe trip. Mm. It's full on, good value. (laughs) You get lots of pages for your money. (laughs) Lots of pages for your money. Um, That is a good one, I think. But my latest one is Walking the Great North Line. I think that's a pretty good book. Yep, I love that book. Really, really enjoyed it. So tell us a little bit more about that, because you basically kind of invented this new route based on some of your own personal observations. Yeah, that's kind of like another form of adventure. I had been staring for a long time at the map of England, and I realized there were lots of ancient sites that seemed to congregate along a certain line. So I extrapolated that line, and it went from Stonehenge down to Christchurch and south and up to Lindisfarne Island. There were about 40 ancient sites on this line. Now, I drew lines every 20 miles either side, and none of them went through nearly as many sites. Hmm. So I just thought, okay, this has a significance. Whether it's just a metaphorical significance or whether it's a real significance, who knows? I didn't try to push that element of it, but it gave it a sort of an interest 
and another dimension. So that's another another way you can sort of jazz up an adventure is by giving some kind of quest element mm. or some extra dimension. I didn't want to just walk the Pennine Way, <laughs> even though I walk a bit of the Pennine Way. And I'm not against long distance. I love long distance walking and I've been done quite a few long distance routes but and enjoyed them fully. But for me, and I think, wouldn't mind doing one in a foreign country, but mm. doing it in England, I thought I've got to have something different. I can't just do the normal regular route. Yeah, and it also gives you a good excuse to stare for long hours at maps, which is kind of yeah. an obsession yeah. of mine. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that, for me, that's how the adventure starts. I put a map, even if I'm not, for example, the Pyrenees, I didn't even, I walked the GR10 and the combination of the GR10 and the high route, which is from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And that started, I wasn't even sure I was going to do it. I just put the map up of the whole Pyrenees on my wall. And it was just there for days, weeks, maybe even a couple of months. But it gradually became a reality to me. So for me, often that's the start is the map. If you are interested in adventuring, just pick a country and just put a map of that country on the wall and just get used to it. And yeah. somehow the adventure will start growing in, in your head. I like that. So do you have any final tips on how to have more childlike adventures or how to be more childlike? Wow. I would say reading other people's accounts yes. of what constitutes an adventure is a really good starting point because lots of people have good ideas. There are quite a few websites. There's this chap, Alistair Humphreys, who's made a whole thing. I mean, I know him. He's a really nice bloke. He's done a whole thing about micro adventures. Yeah. And some of those, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily want to slavishly copy them, but some of those might give you a, an idea or a starting point. Absolutely. Um, so those are the things. Get yourself some tools for adventure like... And in this pack craft thing I've got, it costs, they're very strong. They're made from very strong materials, so they don't puncture. So mm. they're kind of worth it. But they cost hundreds of pounds or even up to a couple of thousand dollars for a big one. But there are cheaper forms of inflatable boat. I think inflatable boats are, are just great fun. Mm. Or, or, you know, a mountain bike with panniers or just some kind of kit. But actually yeah. all you really need is is a pair of walking boots, probably. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the thing. I think we get caught up in we have yeah, to have all the stuff yeah, and all the yeah. best stuff and yeah. this is better than that. And really, if you just get started, and then also, you can always really, improve. Also, really kind of useless. I mean, I've got a 10-year-old. This inflatable canoe is 10 years old. One of the bladders inside it is leaking. It doesn't leak tremendously. I just have to blow it up about every day or so. So, But this is a brilliant piece of equipment. I don't need anything better. So... There is a sense of that. Make do with what you've got. Yeah. Old, broken and rubbish stuff can be quite useful, but on eBay for next to nothing. Yeah, absolutely. So as a segue into my final question, would you describe today's kind of social media, big data culture as anti-adventure, pro-adventure or neutral? Well, in some ways, it makes things a lot easier. Mm. You know, I just think you've got to use the Internet. Don't let it use you. Yes. So you can use it to find out loads of information. You can use it to buy kit. In that sense, the internet is useful. Yeah. And when you're on the trail, if you're having proper adventures, you're probably where there isn't any internet. Yeah. <laughs> There's no phone coverage. <laughs> and if you've got phone coverage, you're in the wrong place. So that solves that problem in a way. And if you are sort of obsessed by checking your stuff, you've got a sat phone and your tent. Well, that does seem a bit silly because you're going to miss out on the real, you know, I like carrying proper maps. I don't like using a phone and having mm. to charge it and be tied to charging points and all that sort of thing. So but that's more to do with removing technology. I think life, if you take it as it's served up to people, you know, you do a job, you spend all your time watching Netflix. I think that's just a pretty crummy version of living. Yeah. And therefore, adventure is a huge kind of step away from that. Mm. And it's one in which... All those sort of problems of the internet and social media tend to fade away. I do know people who are sort of adventurous. They're kind of show off adventurous. <laughs> they don't do it only yeah. to post stuff. But that, after a while, and also the sort of things they're doing are, again, these thrill type adventures where, you know, there is a photo opportunity. Yeah. They're not usually, you know, if you're going to walk the Pennine Way, there aren't any photo opportunities for that. You know, you're just going to have to do it. So it kind of solves it. So, in answer to your question, I think. Take the advantages of the mm -hmm. current era and by going on adventures, you'll find that the disadvantages tend to sort of fade away and become less pressing. Yep. Perfect. So where can people find you online and learn more about what you do? Well, if they get to my website, robertswigger.com, I've got 
thousands <laughs> of pages of blog articles, um, some of which may be useful. I've got the books, which you can find on Amazon. Mm-hmm. I have an Instagram, yes. which is also Robert Twigger. If they're into the comic, there is material about that on the – and you can subscribe to the comic from the website. Okay, perfect. Well, excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Holly. It's been great talking to you and really interesting. Great. Thanks Thank you. Thank you. Please drop me a line and let me know what you thought of this week's episode. You can email me at holly at hollywharton.com or find me online and get in touch there. If you enjoyed this episode, you might enjoy the related episodes. Episode 409, I talk about what does adventure mean to you. 407, I talk with Keith Foskett about through hiking long distance trails in the US and Spain. 406, I talk with Yvette Webster about how outdoor adventures can help with mental health. 370, I talk with Brad Borkin about how outdoor adventures can help you make better decisions in life. And finally, episode 359, I talk with Adam Wells about how to prepare for your first long distance trail. So thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a quick review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Next week, I'm back with another exciting guest. And in the meantime, remember to visit hollywharton.com forward slash 433 for the show notes on this episode. Happy trails to you. Thanks so much for listening to Into the Woods with Holly Wharton. You can find more information about today's episode, including links for topics that were discussed at hollywharton.com. That's H-O-L-L-Y-W-O-R-T-O-N.com. If you'd like to connect with other listeners and get support on your journey, I would love for you to join my private community on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Holly Wharton. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Holly Wharton. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to seeing you next week.